Okay, folks. So ready for your two questions. Who's not in a group yet? Anybody in the class who's not in a group yet? Yeah. Okay. Who's not picked a company yet? Seriously? I checked the master list this morning. So either you're lying about picking a company or you picked a company and not entered. If you picked a company, please enter the company's name in the master list. Don't look at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. That tells me you're not reading my emails either. There is a master list for this class with all your names in it. And all I ask you right now is to enter. There are multiple columns. Ignore the other columns. I ask you, are you in a group? Yes or no? And then what company have you picked? And don't browse through the rest of the list. It has no relevance to you that other people might have picked your company. It's, it doesn't matter. So once you got your company, pick it. Yeah. Just go in and change it. It's not locked up. So basically only the, I think the, the top cells are locked up. So if you pick a company and you want to change it, you're not locked in. This is just to make me sleep at night knowing that you picked a company, right? Okay? So it's really just so if you are not quite sure, but you have something that you're thinking about right now, put it in. But remember, you got a group to work with. So it's that's another constraint, right? So you can't just pick different companies once you got a group and you got a theme going. So let's talk about corporate governance. Sounds like we're spending an awful lot of time not talking about the things that you thought you were going to talk about, right? No beta, no cost of capital. But I mean it when I say that if you get the end game wrong, everything else becomes irrelevant. So we're talking about the classical corporate finance objective, utopian world where everything works out great, you maximize stock prices, you create no side costs. And then we ripped it apart, which left us in a bad place because you rip apart the classic objective, you got to come up with something else. And we went through a series. We said, what about a different corporate governance system? And we talked about the German and the Japanese systems. No way of cross holdings where managers keep an eye on each other. And we talked about the pluses of those systems. They're less, they have less side costs, right? You don't have hostile acquisitions. You have, don't have all the costs of markets being the ones that keep companies in line. But the downside is managers have their incentives to hide stuff, to essentially not deal with big mistakes when they happen. It happened in Korea in the 1990s. It happened, it's been happening in Japan for 30 years. Then we talk, what about a different metric? Maximize market share, maximize revenue growth, maximize income. Or if a consultant comes in, maximize, you know, CFR, OI, maximize whatever metric. Again, remember it's an intermediate metric. Maximizing market share by itself is a silly objective because you can get 100% market share by selling everything below cost, but what have you accomplished? Maximizing users, maximizing subscribers, but you can see why people latch on, right? It's, it's a metric they can focus on. They say, that's it's more immediate. Let's forget about value, it's too abstract. We also said, you know, what about picking stakeholder wealth, you know, going for this broader objective? And I said some dyspeptic things about it, but I won't take a single word back. I just, you know, it is what I believe that if you try to maximize everyone's well-being, nobody is going to be taken care of and give CEOs lack of accountability. If you're accountable to everyone, you're not accountable to anyone. So that circles me back because after checking out all these alternatives, what do I do? I'm going to take you back to maximizing shareholder wealth. And I'm going to make my best arguments for why it's still going to be the framework. It might not be stock prices because that requires markets to be efficient, but why maximizing shareholder wealth still kind of ends up becoming, even for companies that claim otherwise, the driving force in how you make decisions. And I gave you the starting point for, for my, my defense of maximizing stock prices or shareholder wealth. It's not that markets are perfect. They're far from it but it's because markets are self-corrective. I mean, let's take the four linkages we've talked about, right? We talked about how shareholders have little power over managers through the board of directors and annual meetings and managers take advantage of them, right? If that happens long enough, we're gonna talk about what happens in markets to keep those companies in line. 
things like proxy fights, activist investors, hostile acquisitions. None of those are pleasant mechanisms, right? People lose jobs. And you've heard people argue about how costly they are. But they're the mechanisms market, markets use for pulling companies back from extremes. We talked about being Nabisco. Think about what happened at Nabisco to bondholders that al allowed them to be taken advantage of. Then think about what you might have done differently as a bondholder to prevent that from happening. And that's basically what you saw in the late 80s and 90s, corporate bond markets trying to fix the Nabisco problem. So bond, bond markets try to fix overreach, getting ripped off by coming up with new types of bonds and protections. We talked about how companies delay information, sometimes lie to markets. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when that eventually comes out. The question is not if, it's when. You can't keep lying for eternity, even though it seems like you do. But eventually, the truth catches up with you. And we'll talk about what happens in markets when companies finally admit that they've been cooking the books. And we also will talk about markets being irrational, but how within markets as a mechanism to pull people back to work. 2022 as a reminder to many companies, you can't just focus on users and subscribers. You have to figure out a way to make money. And every decade or so, you see this process play out in markets. And finally, a company that walks too close to the line creates huge social costs is not just going to get backlash in the press, there's going to be real consequences. They're going to be targeted by governments for laws that are specifically directed at punishing them, and nobody will come to their defense. Think tobacco companies in the 1990s. When your tax is directed just at tobacco, nobody said that's unfair because they were viewed as beyond the pale. So I'm going to take you through these mechanisms, and you can make your decision as to whether they're strong enough to work or not, but it's a judgment call you got to make. So let's look at what happens when stockholders hit that critical mass of being pissed off. So you're pissed off, you're pissed, finally you've hit it. Right? You ever seen the movie Network? You know, it's, uh, the, there's an anchor who gets up and says, he, that he basically can't take it anymore. You've reached that state of, hey, I'm tired of being taken advantage of. Now, you by yourself with a thousand shares, what are you going to do, right? But you're mad. And if you allow markets to play out, here are some of the things you're going to start seeing. Annual meetings, instead of being exquisitely polite affairs, are going to get pretty angry. People are going to get up and complain. Why? Because they've seen their stock drop 30%. That by itself doesn't hurt managers, right? They, they might be a little hurt by what you tell them, but then they go back to doing what they're doing. Second, shareholders get more receptive to people coming to them and saying, hey, these guys don't know what they're doing. Why don't you sell your, why don't you, you don't even have to sell your shares. Why don't you give us the votes that you're going to throw into the trash can and we will vote? That's what a proxy fight is. Now you think about activist investors. Activist investors usually have names. They're not companies. They're Carl Icahn. You know why they have names? Because they want to be visible. Did Nelson Peltz want the world to know that he wanted to? Absolutely. That's part of the process of activist investing. We look at what it is about Disney that made them a target for Nelson Peltz. And you're going to see a very simple game come into play as to when companies get targeted. I know people dislike activist investors. They're not nice people. I don't want to go out to dinner with Carl Icahn. I'm afraid he'd eat me. But you know what? I'm glad there are the Carl Icahns and the Bill Ackmans of the world. This is going to sound incredibly crude, but I think of activist investors as market laxatives. A market without activist investors gets constipated. It just gets, I mean, everything, nothing moves. Think of Europe. Mainland Europe for the longest time has been a constipated market. You have a company run by bad management. Nothing you can do because activist investors were viewed as crude people. You couldn't allow them into markets. But the reason companies get targeted by activist investors is because shareholders in those companies are receptive to what, share, what activist investors are saying. And finally, the ultimate threat to companies that keep abandoning their shareholders, doing where managers do what they want, 
is they get targeted in hostile acquisitions. What's the essence of a hostile acquisition? Somebody or a company targets your company and says, we're going to acquire your company. And the word hostile carries is loaded, right? Because it tells the world, right after we take over the company, we're going to get rid of the management. They're incompetent. They don't know what they're doing or they just don't care. So when you see those processes work out, you're seeing markets essentially correct their mistakes. So let me use Disney to kind of illustrate how this process played out. Remember the worst board ever that I showed you in 1997? And the man running Disney then was a man called Michael Eisner. That was the height of his power. And think of why he was so powerful. He'd done a really good job at Disney from 1986 through 97 to take it from a company that had been a has-been in the entertainment business, living off Walt Disney's legacy to a company that effectively was one of the larger, more dynamic players. And he'd use the power to create an imperial, you know, become an imperial CEO. And the problem when you have power at some point in time, it goes to your head. And one of the ways it manifests itself is CEOs decide that they can do whatever they want. It's human nature. So if you get a chance, you might want to go back and read about the story of how Cap Cities, I'm sorry, Disney bought Cap Cities. And Michael Eisner used to tell the story proudly of how he met the CEO of Cap Cities, ABC, at a, at a retreat in Sundance or some, some upscale place. And he told him, I'm going to buy your company. They arranged the acquisition basically on a, across a coffee table. And he said, look, I didn't have to consult anybody. I knew this was the right thing for Disney to do. He made a huge bet on Cap Cities by, those, by the standards of those days. He, took, he bought a company that was about a third of the size of his company in a big acquisition. And he promised Disney shareholders, I know what I'm doing. And the board, of course, went along with him. Let's put it this way, that acquisition did not go well for Disney. In fact, the part of that acquisition, the only part of the acquisition that really created value for Disney was a piece thrown in in the acquisition that became a cash cow that Disney became very dependent on for the next 20 years. You know what that piece was called? 96. Piece called ESPN. 96, it was this tiny add-on. <laughs> Disney actually didn't buy Cap Cities for ESPN. They bought it for ABC at that time, one of the lead networks. They said, we're getting this, this great access to people. The way this then played out is because that Cap City acquisition was so troubled, the stock price kept dropping and dropping. And here's the, what happens to CEO power. If your stock price keeps dropping, your power starts to drain away. And remember that very compliant board that he'd created? A couple of the board members, Roy Disney and Stanley Gold, and one of those names should, should actually carry more weight than any typical director, resigned from the board. And the reason they gave was, Michael Eisner doesn't listen to us. So already you can see that Disney, as its stock price is dropping, people are getting rested. The shareholders, in this case, a couple of the directors. And in early 2004, Comcast, targeted Disney in perhaps the most insulting, hostile acquisition ever. You know what made it insulting? Usually when you're trying to acquire a company, let's say it's trading at $30. What do you do? You offer 40 or 45 because that's how acquisitions got done. You know what Comcast did? They took Disney stock price and offered $5 less. It really didn't want to do the acquisition. They were spitting in Disney's face saying, look, your shareholders hate you so much, they will sell their shares at a discount to get rid of you. Needless to say, the acquisition didn't go through, but the damage was done. And Michael Eisner knew that he was in trouble. So what's the first thing he did? He went to that board and said, I'm going to make it better. The threat of an impending execution focuses the mind. So he said, I'm going to create a more independent board. So he made a concession on that. Remember, he was the chairman of the board. He stepped down and he made George Mitchell the chairman of the board. And he made a bunch of changes to improve corporate governance. So I'm going to not even going to list them. But basically, he was saying, look, you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to turn a new leaf. I'm going to listen to you guys. I'm going to create a board that actually protects your interests. 
but it was too late. By the time he did this, even the board realized that he was becoming a liability. So in 2005, Michael Eisner stepped down. No CEO ever gets fired. They step down. They have, you know, whatever. I, they're going to addiction, you know, treatment, whatever. Something that every word except fire. He stepped down. He stepped down not because he wanted to, but because the backlash had gotten too strong. And he was replaced by a man called Bob, Bob Iger. You know how in politics you go from one person to the exact, you try to pick another person with the exact opposite personalities because you think that's going to be much better? Bob Iger was the anti-Michael Eisner. A man who'd been in entertainment all his life, had a small ego, listened to people, and he made a difference. He came in, he created a board that was much more independent up front. And for the first three years that Iger ran the company, first few years, he did a great job. In fact, Disney became ranked as one of the best companies in terms of corporate governance, listens to its, its, um, its shareholders, its board is effective. And in 2011, Bob Iger did something that at that time made him stand out. He said, look, I've been CEO already for a few years. It's time for me to think about transition. So I plan to step down in 2015. And I want to give you enough time to manage the transition. This is good, right? CEOs look ahead and say manage the transition, but willing to step down without getting pushed out. And this is when things started to go bad for Disney. Here's the first thing the board did when he said he was going to step down. They made him chairman of the board again. Remember that you know, they said, you have only four years here. You, you might as well rule like an emperor for the next four years. Stockholders started to get restive again because it looked like the board was doing everything that Iger wanted. And then in 2014, with the year left to Iger's decision to step down, the board went to Iger and said, you can't step down. Have you ever seen uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar? I mean, at the time, you know, Rome was run by a Senate and Julius Caesar was the head of the Senate. But Senate, they had two-year terms, I think, and you got voted out. And Julius Caesar was very successful in his first term. So a bunch of senators of that time went up to Caesar and said, you can't step down. You got to become emperor. And he said, no, 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 I'm not good enough for emperor. They said, okay. A month later, they go, you really, really can't step down. You have to be emperor. He said, no, no, I'm not, no, you know, that, that, that critical to Rome. The third time they come, and this might be all in, Bill Sha in, in Shakespeare's head, the third time they offered him the crown, he said, you know what? That looks like it'll fit on my head. So Iger probably was reluctant the first time, but the, by the ter third time the board came around, he said, you know what? I am Disney. And I think I'll stay on. And it created ripple effects that Disney is still playing out today. Because here's what happened. Remember he planned to step down in 2015. There was an entire group of managers who were waiting in Disney, ready to, in fact, Thomas Tax, who was supposed to be Iger's successor, well regarded Disney, had been waiting around. And of course the board says, Iger's going to stay on and Stag says, okay, I'm leaving. One by one, everybody who was supposed to be waiting left because they said, we're not waiting around. By the time you get to 2018, the cupboard was empty. There was nobody in the wings and you can blame the board in 2015 for the action they took. Finally, as you know, February, 2020, Amazing timing leading into COVID. Iger says he's finally stepping down. And he picks this guy, Bob Chapek, who'd run parks before, a guy with very little background in entertainment. He made him CEO. 
I don't know what the plan was. Maybe Iger thought he could pull the strings from the back and essentially be the power behind the throne. But let's say it did not work out well. And what I've done here is graphed out Disney's stock price to show you how much that is a factor in backlash. So that's the blue line going up and down. So you can see it peaks around 2021 and then you don't even, if you're a Disney shareholder, that's paying all the way down. And in the bottom, I've basically listed out First, what Chapek did when he came into Disney, he came in and he restructured the company and made Disney Plus the center of the company. This is a company, the history of making movies and content. He said, everything, Disney streaming is going to be the heart of our business, everything. So he actually reorganized the company around his vision. Yeah. The board has to act on your body. I mean, remember, it, it would be chaos if you had direct democracy, right? No, it's, yeah. Is there anything shareholders could do to protect, like, raising that goes on if people don't get promoted? How do you could they do that? No, that's, that's a different question. How do you get to that's in, That's possible, but for term limits, who has to vote for it? You collectively do. And getting institutional investors to go along is almost impossible. I think you're making a very good case for CEOs being term lim limited because it looks like the longer you stay on a CEO, the more you become an imperial CEO. I mean, Bob Iger. So this shows that it, it's not the personality. It's the power that comes from being in a position too long that is effectively leading to this dysfunctional behavior. So you, gave, you put Disney streaming in front. And you're saying, so what? The amount of money Disney spent on content doubled in 2021. Why? You've seen The Mandalorian, right? It's one of the shows that allowed Disney Plus to sign a lot. You know how much one episode of The Mandalorian cost Disney? This was when they first, it was 25 million. The new season, it's going to cost them close to 35 to 40 million an episode. Think of what it costs to create an eight episode season. And it's not just Disney. This is the bane of the streaming business, right? When you look at shows that cost 35, 40 million, you produce eight episodes at a time. That's like a $300 million ep no, investment. And it's very difficult to figure out whether it's actually making you money. It's not like a movie that you release in theaters. You can look at gate receipts. I make The Mandalorian for Disney Plus, and I'm told we're signing up more subscribers. That's what the streaming guy is going to tell you. How do you tell? And that Disney streaming sucked through all the cash flows. Because Disney has a couple of cash cuts. One is, of course, ESPN. What makes ESPN a cash cut? It's sports, but no, there are lots of sports channels, but ESPN has a special place that goes back in time. I mean, it goes back to the time when most Americans and most people around the world got their, their TV through cable. So you'd get a cable package, right? With 300 channels, most of which you did not watch. You know how the cables, um, cable channels got those 300? I mean, the cable companies got the 300 channels. They got, a, you know, they basically pay each channel. So if the Hallmark channel, 25 cents a month, they carry. ESPN was the most expensive channel in the whole list. It cost $8 a month to carry ESPN. For, so if you're a cable company and you refuse, there would be no ESPN on your list and your viewers would get pissed off. There were 90 million cable subscribers towards the peak of cable. 90 million people each paying $8 a month to ESPN every month. That's a cash cut. Sports and live sports was there without, you can watch recorded sports, but without us, you can't watch live sports. That was the first cash cow. The other, of course, is there. What's the other business that Disney has that's a cash cow? The theme park business right? Hey, you go to Disneyland now, you got to pay $40 if you want what used to be the fast pass, right? I was going to say they're nickel and dime you. It's really much more than that. They're dollar and dollar you for every add-on that you can think of. 
So the cash cows were feeding the cash, but Disney Plus streaming was so expensive, it was sucking all that cash more, the stock price. In fact, October of 2022, when they made their earnings report, the report was an awful report. Streaming was costing 35 billion. There was no end in sight. And the way Chapek handled that earnings call, I mean, lots of people had said, is this guy in denial or does he just not know what's going on? And a month later, of course, Iger is back. And along the way, you started to see activist investors pop up. Dan Lowe, an activist investor, showed up in September of 2022. And then, of course, Nelson Peltz shows up later. What I'm trying to say is when you see companies targeted, it's not accidental. Activists don't cover their eyes and say, let me point to a company and show up. They're doing it because there's a set of circumstances that lead shareholders to question whether the company is going the right way. Now, if you watch the, if you get a chance, go and read about or watch the earnings call from two days ago that Disney, what is it, early last week. And of course, Iger made a series of changes. He's announcing he's cutting costs. He's announcing that he's going to, he announced that he's also going to bring streaming back under the, you know, under the supervision and uh, basically adult supervision. These guys can't keep spending money making more and more shows. The market liked it, but Iger got another outcome that he probably liked even more. What happened after the earnings report? What did Nelson Peltz do? He withdrew. He said, you know what? The shareholders seem a little too happy in this company right now. I'll come back later if they're not happy. But that shareholder unhappiness is a key to actually getting change in these companies. And you can see it happen in company after company. Now, I want to say something about companies in the 21st century versus the 20th century and how we might be setting ourselves up. No. For a problem. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the corporate life cycle, which you know I talked about early in the class, and how the right type of manager for a company is going to be different depending on where you're in the life cycle. The, the, the reason I do this is I want to push back against a McKinsey Harvard Business School view of there is a perfect CEO. I read at least 40 articles from the Harvard. I try not to read the Harvard Business Review. It causes brain cells to die. But once in a while, I force myself to read it. There are at least 40 articles from the Harvard Business Review. The characteristics that make a perfect CEO, they list out 15 characteristics. And McKinsey is their, is their uh, partner in arms in this. And you can see why both Harvard uh, Business School and McKinsey have a vested interest in selling you the idea that there are there is this perfect CEO. Because you know what follows, right? I mean, I've described Harvard Business School as a place where people go to be CEOs in waiting. Every MBA enters Harvard Business School already is a CEO in waiting, at least in their minds. And Harvard Business School says, we know how to create the perfect CEO. And there was a point in time where half of the S&P 500 companies were headed by people who used to be McKinsey consultants. This notion that there is this template for a perfect CEO is absolute nonsense, and here's why. If you think about the qualities you need to be a great CEO, let's start with startups. In a startup, you know who you want running your company? Steve the visionary. Somebody, because it's vision that drives the company, right? There's no substance, but you have to attract investors, you have to attract employees. But if you have a visionary who's a purist, and some of you might have operated or worked in business with purest visionaries, you know what happens, right? The business never takes off because every idea or product you come up with, it's not perfect enough. You need a pragmatist to convert vision to products and services. So let's call the right CEO for the second stage, Paul of the pragmatist, somebody who can take a vision and say, you know what, I'm willing to compromise on that because I need to create a product or service. So now you created a product or service. What's the next step? You need to build a business. What does that involve? Nasty stuff like building supply chain. So boring. If you're a visionary, do you ever want, can you imagine Elon Musk sitting in on a three hour supply chain meeting? Three minutes in, he said, this is so boring. I'm gonna go build some robots. 
or bore a hole in the ground. But you need builders. You need somebody who can build the production, the man, then the supply chain. So let's call the perfect CEO, Bob, the builder. Now you've started to build a business and you're starting to grow, you, you've got growth. And your growth starts to hit walls because your product has hit the easy. Then you need somebody who's opportunistic who essentially can say, okay, I see an opportunity in this market or this product can take existing products. You need a CEO who's more opportunistic to keep growth going. And then you become the CEO of a mature company. What's your primary job? You have a product that's providing you great earnings and cash flows. You want to defend it. That's your first job. You can come up with new stuff, but you better not leave your core business undefended. Make it through that stage, you're in decline. We talked about Danny DeVito, Larry the liquidator. That's the right CEO for a declining company. You do not want a visionary running a declining company. There's, that's a match made in hell. You don't want Larry the liquidator running a startup. There will be no startup left. What makes for bad CEOs is mismatches. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think the same person can go from being visionary to pragmatist to builder to defender? Maybe. But it's really difficult, right? Because it requires a different mindset. You think, haven't we always had this problem? In the 20th century, you know what took care of this problem? Time was your ally. Take Ford, founded in what, late 1800s, early 1900s. Who's the first CEO of Ford? A man called Henry Ford, cantankerous, eccentric genius. He made the automobile go from being this luxury product to something that was a mass market product with the Model T Ford. What colors did the Model T Ford come in? One, black. Why? Hey, he's an eccentric. He said, who would ever want to drive a car that's not black? What eccentrics do? But he built this growing company. By the time you get to the 1930s, Henry Ford was more liability than asset because he had some very strange political beliefs as well. But you know what? Time took care of the problem. He died and he was succeeded by his son, who happened not to be, as a, you know, you know, whatever the political beliefs didn't get passed to him. He was the right person now. He, he didn't have the vision that is, you know, Henry Ford did, but he brought a very different set of skills. The typical 20th century company, because it lasted long, time took care of the problem. In contrast, think Blackberry, right? Canadian company founded by, I forget their names, these two Canadians were lauded as geniuses because they built this company from nothing to a product that everybody was carrying around by the late 90s. And then what happens? The iPhone comes along and these guys are incapable of swiveling or adjusting to the new. They keep doing what they were doing and they drive. It's amazing. You see the company, it rises, it collapses. Same people running the company in both its rise and its collapse because they did not have the skill set to keep going. The typical 21st century company is not going to last 125 years. It's probably going to last 25, 30, 35 years. And we have a problem because the people who found these companies might be the right people to run these companies in the first three, four, five, even 10 years. But there will be a point where you're saying, this no longer is working for us. But we've dug a hole for ourselves. We've dug a hole for ourselves because in a typical company at some point, you can say, well, we can push the founder out because the company shares will get more. You know, as you grow, you're going to raise fresh capital. Yeah, you know, you'll have more shares outstanding. At some point, you're not going to have a controlling interest. And enough people will feel you're the wrong person to be able to push you out. So what have we done to screw that process up? Last 10, 15 years, you look at almost every IPO. It comes with two classes of shares voting shares and non-voting shares. And when you do that, you have what you have at Facebook. 
I wrote this piece at Facebook's absolute bottom. This was like four months ago, five months ago. Remember they came out with an earnings report where they said they were going to spend $100 billion in the metaverse. And the market said, you're going to do nothing with it. They actually, the market was pricing Facebook on the assumption they're going to dig a hole in the ground, throw $100 billion, nothing would come out. They just did not trust the company. Now we can debate whether the company should be run differently, but let's face it. This is a corporate autocracy. It's not a corporate democracy. And the reason is simple. If you look at Mark Zuckerberg, he owns 13.5% of the outstanding shares at Facebook. That's good, right? We have, we have 86, 87% to push him for change. The only problem is because he owns the shares with the voting rights, he effectively controls the company with that holding. I'll make a prediction. You're going to get technology company after technology company. We're going to see what happened at Facebook play out. You're going to see institutional investors whine about the fact that Mark Zuckerberg is not listening to them. Well, you bought into the two classes of shares, right? If you stood up for yourselves and said, look, we're not going to go along being second class citizens. I mean, I remember when Alibaba went public and I was in CNBC and somebody said, would you buy Alibaba shares? I said, not really, because you know, Jack Ma wants my money. It's like I'm checking into a five-star hotel. He takes my money and then makes me go stay in the outhouse saying, you know, go hang out there. You want my money, but you don't want my input. And in the case of companies like these where and it could be a young company. It could happen 15 years into its life because you're changing so much. You're going to run into a problem with the existing management no longer works, but you don't have the mechanism to move them out. So I predict what you see at Facebook, you're going to see play out in company after company. And you're going to see people complain about the fact that they don't have the capacity to get managers to listen, but we've created a system where they don't have to. So that's the first link. You can see how the process plays out. Any questions on activist investing, hostile acquisitions? Lots of stuff going on. But you can already see how disquiet with existing management can play out in lots of different ways. Let's talk about bondholders. Let's go back to the Nabisco example. You bought bonds in Nabisco when it was a double A rated company, thinking it was a nice, safe company, right? Now, what did they do that, that undercut you? Anybody? What did Nabisco do that, that, that caused you pain? They went out and borrowed a ton more money, making themselves riskier, lowering the rating. But you know what really hurt you is you're continuing to be paid the same interest you were paid for lending to a safe company. It's not what they did that is hurting you. It's the fact that you can't adjust your interest rate to what they, in a sense, change the rules of the game, but you didn't protect yourself against that rule change. Is there something you could have done when you lent money or bought those bonds that might have protected you? Because there were two things that, that, that bondholders figured out should be added to bonds after Nabisco. No. You heard of putable bonds? In a putable bond, here's what you get as a bondholder. You get the right to put the bond back to the company and get your face value back. And the put, puttable bonds are triggered by what's, what lawyers might call a significant event. Things like a leverage buyout. You say, look, that changes the, rule of the rules of the game. I lent to you on the assumption that it was a nice, mature company, borrowing little. You've gone out and done a leverage buyout. I'm going to put my bonds back. You see how that would have protected you. You'd have got your face value back. Let other people play, you know, feel the pain. The second is Mary Lynch in the late 1980s created these bonds called rating sensitive bonds. You say, what are rating sensitive bonds? When you lend money to Nabisco, you set an interest rate based on the fact that they were a double A rated company. So you set a low interest rate, safe company. They've now become a double B rated company. They're a risky company. With a rating sensitive bond, your coupon rate will be adjusted to reflect the fact that you've now lent to much. So instead of paying you 7%, they have to pay you 12%. That's going to protect you as well. Because in a sense, now you're going to get a bond that even though there's been a leverage part, the price is not going to drop through. Now remember, 
None of this is going to help you as a Nabisco bondholder. That pain's already been felt, but at least bonds can be innovated to keep the next Nabisco from happening. So when Ad the Adani group bondholders complain about what the group did to them, there's much, there might be nothing they can do at this stage other than mark down the price. But the next time you lend to a family group company, you might have to think about clauses that you put in there to protect yourself a little better. To overreach the bond market, there's a backlash. Let's talk about what happens when you lie to financial markets. First, let's talk about the flow of information. There was a time when the primary, almost 80%, 90% of the information you got about a company came from the company, even on large companies. Equity research analysts basically operated at the margin. They would get little rumors, but they were just you know, restating what the company was stating. This was as true as, as 40 years ago. And if you had a small company that nobody followed, God help you, the only source of information was the company. That is no longer the case. You want to invest in a company, just do a Google search on the company. You'd be amazed at what you can find out about the company. Information is now freely accessible. I'm not saying it's perfect, but Companies no longer completely control the flow of information. Information seems to leak out. So the information process has become more accessible. We can access information. But companies still pull off, not frauds, you know, accounting malpractice. And eventually they get found out, right? Just reading this morning about... by a company, a Brazilian company called Americanas. It's a retail company. In fact, it's controlled by one of Brazil's most visible investor groups, 3G Capital. For those of you familiar with Americanas, in the, they've had a, the, the way they described it, they said they have a $3 billion hole in their balance sheet. I will let your imagination fill in what that exactly means. But if you're a lender, this is not good. So the news has come out. And this happens to every company. At some point in time, the, the news hits. What happens to stock price when it hits for the company? Collapses. That's a first layer effect. But there's a second layer effect that is perhaps even more devastating. It collapses and it stays down, no matter what you say. Why? Because you have no credibility, right? Nobody believes you anymore. The perils of lying to markets are not just that the stock price drops, but you can't really convey your plans because nobody believes you anymore. I'm going to say something that's going to sound odd. I don't condone, but I understand mature companies committing accounting fraud. Because you're hoping to get you know, extra 10% for the... But if you're a growth company, what the heck are you doing playing accounting games? 90% of your value is for what you'll do in the future, which rests entirely on you being credible. So I remember when Groupon went public and they played all kinds of stupid accounting games for the first two quarters. And your reaction was, what are you guys even thinking? So when you look at markets, again, I'm not going to make mar the argument that markets are efficient and rational and cool, but they figure it out eventually. And when they figure it out, there's no ego. They correct their mistakes overnight. So let's talk about society. Is society a player in the game? Of course, we're all shareholders in companies, but we're also members of society. So in a sense, we don't want a company that increases our share price by creating huge costs for society. So you're saying, is this an argument for ESC? Well, that's not where ESG is pushing. ESG wants to make you look good in terms of what you do for society. But I'm going to make a financial argument for why you want to bring in society, the side costs and side benefits into your decision making. Even if you're on the right side of the law, if you're doing things that create huge social costs, they'll catch up with you. So John... John Manville, which is a company that made asbestos, when they first made asbestos, thought this was an amazing building product because it was light. People working in order to carry these heavy steel could now carry asbestos. They didn't do it to cause cancer. 
But somewhere along the way, they did find this link to cancer. And rather than deal with it, they pushed it under. And that then caused this huge class action lawsuit. And they went bankrupt. Vale, one of the mining companies in our group, has played fast and loose with environmental rules. And in fact, a dam that they'd built somewhere in Brazil had flaws. It broke open, thousands of people died. They're still trying to pick up the pieces on what that means. I think it does make sense to build in constraints in how you operate as a business if you want to maximize that. You don't want to do, there's a big difference between maximizing earnings and maximizing value. There's a cost to being too loose with the rules, playing too close to the line. So my argument is, hey, we want to maximize shareholder wealth, but with constraints. I go back to my original point. You can have one objective and multiple constraints. You can make those constraints as binding as you want to make them. But I think if you're running a publicly traded company, you still need a single group to focus on. The group that makes the most sense is shareholders because they are the only ones without a contract. But I think you need to bring in all those other stakeholders, not because you're a nice person, but because you want to maximize value. You know, Scott Galloway and I agree on a lot of things, but one of the things I disagree with Scott on, he is you know, extraordinarily negative on the tech companies. And he feels the only way to counter their power is to break them up. And I remember telling him four years ago, you know what tech gives, tech takes away. You're at the top today. You could very quickly slide, not if not to the bottom, to half the size. So when he put out that thesis in 2019, no, 2020, tech companies were on the top of the world, right? Facebook, Google, basically every single tech company, Netflix. Take a look at each of those companies and where they are today. Of course, Facebook's travails I talked about. And in the last few weeks, you've seen what happened to Google. You're one technological innovation away from your core. I mean, let's face it, Google's business is built around the search box. It gets 93% of its revenues from its search box. Everything else is kind of a side business. AI, and this is what caused the, the kind of meltdown last week, you know, is now packaged with Bing. And you know, you can read the story, but my point is, you know, rather than have these you know, bludgeons where you break, I'm not even sure where you would break a Google down because 93% comes from the search box. If you take the search box and you break everything all, you're actually doing Google a favor, right? Because you now have a cash cow. They can put even more money into the search box. Maybe you can break Facebook down into Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, but it's an ecosystem. They all swim together. How online do you separate them? If, you, if you're willing to let the market meet out punishment, it will meet out much more severe punishment than any government or regulator can do. And that's what I mean by constrained corp uh, corporatism is essentially you bring those constraints in. So let me summarize the end game. If you're in a market with a functioning financial market, a liquid financial market, I think stock price should still be the center of the game because it drives everything else. Look at how much of Disney's you know, joy and pain has come from just tracking the stock price and how much happens when the stock price drops. If you're in a publicly traded company in a market that's not liquid, I was reading about this Abu Dhabi company called IHC, have you ever taken a look? Take a look at this company. You know what its market cap is? $240 billion. Nobody knows what it does. It's a holding company. But the, it's an extraordinarily liquid market with a float of like 3 or 5% of the shares. God only knows what's causing the $240 billion. You definitely don't, don't want to focus on maximizing stock prices in an illiquid market because horrible things can follow, not just for the, for the rest of the world, for you as a company. And if you're a private company, what have I just taken out of the mix? You don't have a stock price. But do you have wealth in the company? Absolutely. There's a value. 
The maximizing value objective applies whether you're a public or a private company. The only problem with the private company is you don't have that observable metric and you're going to miss it not having it. So I'm done with the end game, but you're not done thinking about it because all through this class, it's going to be lurking in the background. And here's how it's going to show up. And I talk about picking projects and I say maximizing net present value going for is good. I'm building on the premise that increasing value is good and decreasing value is bad. But that comes to my objective of, hey, you want to maximize your value as a business. If you disagree with me on net present value, it's not because you disagree with the mechanics. What's there to disagree? It's because you disagree with the end game. I can't force you to go to my end game. I don't want to. But I'm going to argue that there are shades of gray here that you want to bring in. So when you get these, oh, we found the magic bullet to this problem, you haven't because this is as old as private business has been on the face of the earth. And nobody, McKinsey can't do it, ESG can't do it. You can't come in and replace human nature by saying, oh, we found the magic bullet. There are no magic bullets. There are painful fixes we can make. And we have to decide how much pain we're willing to take. So any questions on the end game? If you worked at a nonprofit, as I said in the last session, think about what the end game there was, or if there was an end game, and think about the confusion that comes if you don't know what your end game is. So let's start on the first part of the meat and potatoes part of this class. Let's talk about risk. Risk is not a problem, it's a feature, it's a nature. You can't make it go away. So what we're trying to do in corporate finance is come up with a hurdle rate that reflects the riskiness of your investment. Say, what does it even mean? Let me start with the basic premise. Riskier investments should have higher hurdle rates and safer investments. In practical terms, here's what it means. When I compute what you need to make on investment, I'm going to start with a risk-free rate. So that's what you'd make on a guaranteed investment. Add a risk premium that's going to be higher for riskier investments and lower for safer investments. Sounds like a simple task, right? But to do this, there are two questions I need to answer. One is, what the heck is risk? What do we, and don't let your finance classes brainwash you on this too quickly because Risk is this huge amorphous concept. What is risk? And we have to start by defining risk. I'll give you how, how I think about risk. And then we'll look at whether the risk and return models we look at actually try to do this. The second is once I've decided how to measure risk, how to convert that risk measure into a hurdle rate. We're going to have about 10 sessions just trying to answer those two questions because they're not that straightforward. So let's start with the definition of risk. I'll confess, I find the way we think about risk in finance antiseptic. Because once you've gone through a finance class and ask you, how do you measure risk? What's your answer gonna be? Statistical, standard deviation, beta. And it's a terrible way to think about risk. If you really want to feel risk, and many of you might've felt this already, here's what I suggest you do. Put all your money in a couple of stocks, Wait for a bad day where your stock is dropping 30% a minute. You know that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach? That's risk. Risk is not some number. It's that feeling in the pit of your stomach as you're, you know, yesterday my son, I, I took my son out to dinner and he's a big Super Bowl, he's a big uh, football fan, big Eagles fan too. And he found this play where if, you know, Jalen Hurts, uh, you know, Travis Kelsey scored a touchdown. This, so it's like this, all four have to come together and he makes $10 for every dollar invested. Three of the pieces came together. The fourth piece was the Eagles had to win. And that holding call in the last two minutes might have cost him 10 to 1. And I'm sure that he was not in a good mood. I haven't talked to him since. But I can see him watching the TV. Last, I'm not an Eagles fan. I don't like Philly fans in general. No, just let me put that on the table. No. But I can note that, that that is risk. So I've thought about a better way to define risk. And the best definition of risk I've ever seen is actually the Chinese symbol for crisis or big risk. The Chinese symbol for 
crisis or big risk is a combination of two symbols. It's a symbol for danger plus a symbol of opportunity. You know how many times I've been corrected on this symbol? I get like every time I do it, I get 10 people saying, no, that's not the right symbol. I think the Chinese need to get together and get their symbols together because I keep getting back and forth on, you know, the, maybe it's simplified Chinese versus some other version of Chinese. But I'm going to stick with the symbol because I like that combination. Risk is a combination of danger and opportunity. You know how many mistakes we would avoid in investing if we remember the two were locked at the hip? Because here's what the definition is saying. You want a lot of opportunity and who amongst us doesn't be willing to live with a lot of danger? Oh, you don't like danger? Then don't ask for opportunity. But people seem to forget this all the time, right? Every time you have a scam, what's it based on? Somebody promised you that you could make high returns without any risk. I'll tell you a story. Anybody here from Orange County, California? Yeah, great place to live, sun always shines. Disneyland is a drive away. You know, about 30 years ago, Orange County, at that time, one of the wealthiest counties in the US had to declare bankruptcy. Why? Because the county pension fund had 30% of its in money invested in German interest rate futures. Don't even ask me, no. And it turned out to be a bad bet. The money got blown up. The pension fund essentially wipes out 30%. The county declares bankruptcy. So Bob, the, the treasurer of the county, a man called Bob Citra, you think that's his real name? It sounds, I mean, everybody in Southern California changes their name, I guess. You know, Citrin, Orange, you know, uh, uh, maybe it is his real name. Just like Wolf Blitzer's real name is Wolf Blitzer. You want to be defense correspondent for CNN? Hey, Wolf Blitzer sounds good. So Bob Citrin is on 60 Minutes, being interviewed by Mike Wallace. For those of you who've never seen Mike Wallace, legendary interviewer. So Mike Wallace asked Bob Citrin, Mr. Citrin, why would you take pension fund money that's supposed to be invested in safe things and make a bet on interest rates in Germany? And Bob Citrin says, because Charlie Claude told me I could make 15% with no risk. To which your reaction is, who is Charlie Claude and why is he telling you all these things? Charlie Claude at that time was Merrill Lynch's market strategist. Now, I can tell you with absolute conviction that Charlie Clough would never tell anybody they can make 15% with no risk. Not because I know Mr. Clough, but because I know market strategists. Market strategists are incapable of making decisive statements. That's far too decisive. But let's assume that Charlie Clough got drunk and he told Bob Sitter, you can make 15% with no risk. Let's go back to the interview. Bob Sitter says, and I'm not a finance person. Wait, what's your title? Oh, it's treasurer, a complete mistake. I thought treasurers needed to, but do you know need to be a finance person to know that if somebody comes to you and says, you can make 15% with no risk, they're lying. I mean, if you think you can make 15% no risk, you probably also think that Rolex you bought last week on Canal Street is really a Rolex. I'd strongly recommend that you read the spelling of the Rolex. It probably says R-O-L-E-C-K-S, you know. You pay $45 for a Rolex, it's not a Rolex. You get a Mickey Mantle rookie card for $5, it's definitely not Mickey Mantle or a rookie card. Every scam at its core <coughs> needs two parties. It needs a scammer and it needs, needs a scam. I'm not saying you shouldn't have sympathy for the scammed, but the reality is what draws you to a scam is because you're greedy and you're willing to overlook common sense because this just looks good. Danger plus opportunity, keep that in mind. And it'll make you more skeptical because when somebody says, I can make 18%, what are you probing for? Where's the risk? How much risk is there? Because they claim there's none. They either haven't looked carefully enough or they're hiding it from you. So with that lead in, let's talk about what a good risk and return model should do. Let's start with the utopian world. In a perf in a, what would a perfect risk and return model? 
So here's what a perfect risk and return model will do, at least from my perspective. First, it should come up with a measure of risk that applies across all investments. So you can't have a measure of risk that works only for small companies, only for US companies, only for tech companies. You want a measure of risk that works for stocks and bonds and real estate in the US and emerging markets. You want a risk measure that's universal. Why? Because as an investor, you need to compare across investments. Second, whatever risk and return model you use should very clearly list out which risks you will get rewarded for and which risks basically if you take, you take it essentially with no reward, critical. Third step, you should be able to come up with a risk measure that captures that risk you say you will be rewarded for, a number. You think, but I, no, that's a number, I could be wrong. What's your alternative? Qualitative fuzzy factor, you got to come up with a number. And if I give you that number, it has to be self-standing. In other words, you should be able to look at the number and say, that's a high risk investment. You're saying, what are you talking about? We give you two competing risk measures. First is standard deviation, earning stock prices. If I told you that IBM's stock price standard deviation is 30%, and if you have to gauge whether that's risky or not, what's the problem? You look at the 30%, is that a high number? Is that a low number? You have no sense of perspective, right? If I told you IBM's beta is 1.2, can you tell me whether, at least based on that risk measure, IBM is riskier or safer than the market? It's riskier because it's scaled around one. The nice thing about risk measures that are scaled is I don't have to tell you what the rest of the world looks like. Fourth, I should be able to translate that risk measure into a hurdle rate. Don't forget the end game here. We're not here to play games with risk and return models. It's because we need to come up with a hurdle rate. And there's a fifth condition that's such a pain. It actually has to work. You know what I mean by that, right? You can come up with all these great looking risk and return models, but the hurdle is they're getting a terrible hurdle rates. They don't work. We're in trouble. So I'm gonna start with the oldest risk and return model in use, perhaps still the most widely used risk and return model. It's called the capital asset pricing model. I'm gonna tell you what the model does. And with each step, we're gonna see whether it's close to utopian good model. It starts by using variance of actual returns. It's statistical. It thinks about risk in terms of variance. In return, stock prices. So already it's made a choice of prices over earnings or so the choice you might not agree with. It starts by looking at you know, how much actual returns deviate from that becomes your starting point for measuring risk. So high volatility stocks are riskier than low volatility stocks. So far, sounds pretty intuitive, right? Especially if you're a trader or somebody thinking about markets. The second step is a huge one. It says only that portion of the variance that cannot be diversified away is going to get rewarded. And I'm going to talk about what it is the model assumes that drives them there, but this is huge. It means that you take 100 units of risk and 80 are, is risk you can diversify away. You're going to get rewarded only for the 20. Third step, it measures that non-diversifiable risk with beta. Betas don't measure volatility. They measure the portion of your volatility that cannot be diversified away. Scaled round one. Fourth step, it takes the beta and it converts it to an expected return. We take the risk-free rate plus beta times a risk premium, which is what you charge for the average risk investment to come up with an expected return. So far, it's looking great, right? Fifth step. What I'm going to say is going to damn it in mild ways. It works at least as well as the next best alternative. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say it works well, it works great. It works at least as well as the next best alternative. And it's a lot simpler. So let's start with this and work through each step. You've seen probably derivations of the cap M in a foundations class. I am have zero interest in going through Markowitz optimization and optimal. So what I'm going to do is give you a purely intuitive derivation of the cap M. Let's start with the first step. We measure risk as deviations of actual returns around an expected return. To back this up, I'm going to give you three or four investments. And as I go through the investments, I want you to think about how I'm measuring risk. Let's say you have a one-year time horizon and you buy a one-year U.S. Treasury bill today. The rate is about 4.5%. 
So you go buy the bill today and you can buy it on the, in the, the treasury auction. One year from now, when I come and knock on your door and ask you, what did you make on this investment? What's your answer going to be? Assuming the US treasury doesn't default over the next year, you're going to make exactly four and a half percent. There's no upside, no downside. Your actual returns are equally expected to return. That is a completely risk-free investment. Let's say, we, let's continue with the one-year time horizon. You buy a 10-year T-bond, still the treasury bond. One year from now, I come and knock on your door and say, what did you make on this T-bond? Are you going to give me the same answer you got with the T-bill? What portion of your return is guaranteed? The coupon, what portion is out of your control? The price will change, right? Interest rate change. Remember last year, bond prices were down 21% over the course of the year. Why interest rates went down? A 10-year T-bond is not risk-free if you have a one-year time horizon. I want you to file that away because this notion of a single risk-free rate floating around is mythology. Let's move further up the lungs. Let's suppose I gave you a 10-year corporate bond. In addition to everything I said about the T-bond, what else do you have to worry about? Corporate default risk can change over time. You could go from AAA to AA. So corporate bond is riskier than a T-bond. A T-bond is riskier than a T-bill with a one-year time horizon. What if you bought shares in Coca-Cola? Nice, mature company. You collect a $2 dividend, which is about 2% of the stock price. The price might remove, but you no, know, one year from now, when I come and knock on your door and you said, no, I, and you do it because you expect to make a 9% return, End of the year when I knock on your doors, if it's a good year, you could make 15%. If it's a bad year, you might make 3%. That's a much riskier investment. What if you bought Facebook or Peloton? You tell me your expected return is 12%, right? If you're lucky, what could happen over the next year? Your stock price can double. If you're not, you could lose half. Notice with every one of these investments, when I think about risk, I think about what will happen over the next year. It sounds like an obvious statement. There is no risk in the past, right? We know exactly what happened. But unfortunately, we have a measurement problem in finance. When I ask you how risky is Coca-Cola, how risky is Facebook, how risky is Tesla, what are you trying to do? Go find a Bloomberg terminal, look up the risk. But what is the risk you're seeing when you look at the past? For instance, in 2013, if I looked at Disney, I could have given you a standard deviation, but this is a standard deviation over the last five years, not the next five, because I have no choice. This is a conundrum in finance. All of our data comes from the past. All of our worries are in the future. It's a bridge we've got to cross, but it's reality. So in, corp in, in risk, at least in the CAPM, we define investments with higher, in fact, it's a two-dimensional world. Expected return is good, Standard deviation is bad, but it's only a two-dimensional world. Sounds like an odd thing to say, but I'm going to put you on the spot of an investment decision maker. And you can tell me whether you live, it's called a mean variance world, whether you live in a mean variance world. So here's, my, here's what I'm going to offer you. I'm going to offer you two investments that have the same expected return and the same standard deviation. So in the CAPM world, it should be indifferent, right, between the two. Now, I'm going to offer you some additional information about these investments, and you tell me whether it might affect your indifference. On investment A, there is a very small chance you could quadruple your money. Tiny. It's already embedded in the expected return and standard deviation. Well, investment B, the best you can make is a 60% return. So same expected return, same standard deviation. But one has this very small chance of quadrupling your money. So here's my question. How many of you would be in, still indifferent between the two investments now that I've added that feature? One person, maybe two live in the CAPM world. You can already see why mean variance, you're adopting a framework that is not in line with human nature. Why? And so let, let's finish it. How many of you would prefer investment A because of that very small chance you could quadruple your money? This is why we buy, you no. Know, what's the expected value of buying a lottery ticket? It's the expected return. The state already tells you that, right? They take half the money, it's minus 50%. So why do we buy it? 
Hope Springs Eternal, but also because the potential payoff. If you are lucky enough, what is the, I thought the Powerball is now running at $630 million, right? I don't even have to ask you what you would do if you won $630 million, but you're not going to be in class on Wednesday would be my guess if that happened. But then, you know, there's a tiny, tiny chance, but you can see why that, if, it's called skewness in statistics. This is that tail and a, a positive skewness, which is what that big positive payoff is, investors seem to value it. You know how this plays out? People might invest in small companies, even though they have lower expected returns because there's a bigger potential of payoff. They might invest in tech companies, even though they have lower expected returns because there's that possibly of a payoff. And on the other side, there's another issue. What if I told you that there is a small possibility that you could lose 100% of your money in stock A, but on B, the worst you can do is 50%. Again, for some people, this could come into play, right? Again, statistical terms, this is called kurtosis, basically the size of the tail. So likely. So I know statistics is this foreign, but basically the mean variance world assumes away these preferences we as human beings have for skewness, the potential payoff, and the fact that we don't like big jumps because they make us feel uncomfortable. As we go through the CAPM derivation, I'm going to point out the weaknesses in the assumptions, not because I'm not going to use the CAPM, but I want you to use it as a fully informed person so you know its weakest links. And this is one of its weakest links. You're going to understate expected returns. or So if you use the CAPM, you're going to overstate expected returns for small, risky stocks and perhaps understate them for nice, stable companies. Let's talk about the second step. And to me, this is the make or break moment for finance. You guys have heard of Harry Markowitz. Harry Markowitz won the Nobel Prize, but in a sense, he gave rise to modern finance. Because until he came along, he's a PhD student in Princeton, the way people thought about risk was they said, if it's a risky stock, we need a high expected return. Sounds pretty intuitive. I think the story, and he said this in his Nobel Prize lecture, was he said, I was sitting in the library looking at different stocks, and I asked, what if I own 10 of these stocks? And he said, would I be thinking about risk the same way? And here's why. If you think about the risk in a stock, it can come from multiple places. Let's take Disney. Let's go through some of the risk. Some of the risk can come from the next project they take, that California adventure, the billion dollars they've been spending to try to upgrade it. That's risk specific to Disney. It's a project. Could it pay off? Maybe. Could it not pay off? Yes. And if it doesn't pay off, the only company that's really affected by that is Disney. File that away as you go through because you're gonna look at how many companies get impacted. Let's move further up the ladder. Let's take the streaming business. Is Disney's success in the streaming business going to be determined at least partially by what Netflix does and Warner Brothers does and H? Absolutely. So there's something that affects all of the competitors here, maybe some restrictions on streaming or a change in technology. It's not just Disney that's going to be affected. It's going to be Disney. It's going to be Warner. It's going to be, you know, I don't know, as you go through the list, every streaming company, Netflix. So now you've gone from risk that affects one company to risk that affects maybe 15, 20 companies, the companies that feed into them. Let's keep going further up. Disney, of course, has a broadcasting arm with the ABC, and broadcasting is a regulated business. If there's a regulatory change that affects all broadcasting companies. You now have a risk that affects all of the companies in the sector. So that might be 50, 100, 150 companies. I know it's getting tedious thinking about how many companies are affected, but it's part of the story. Disney also has a lot of revenues outside the US, about 25 to 30% of its revenues. Every time exchange rates change, like last year when the dollar got stronger, it is affecting the earnings they're getting from the, so changes in exchange rates, changes. But let's say the dollar gets stronger. Do you think Disney is the only company that's affected? Probably not, right? There are probably a thousand companies that are affected because a lot of companies have business outside the US. And then, of course, every few months, we have this FOMC committee meeting that happens. The Federal Open Market Committee gets together, and the world comes to a standstill. 
And at least if you buy into the fears that people have about this committee, they're worried about what, what you know, assume that the Fed is a supremely powerful being that some people attribute it to be, that they can raise interest rates. Let's say interest rates go up. Inflation is higher than expected. Is Disney going to be affected? Of course it is going to be affected. But so is every other investment in the market. See how we've gone from risk that affects one company to risk that affects most raw companies? You're saying, who cares? If you create a portfolio, and we're, let's not go to the limits and talk about how many stocks. Let's say you create a portfolio of 15, 20, 25, 30 stocks. Remember, each of those stocks is going to be impacted by project specific, because each takes projects. But remember, the nature of projects is in some of your companies, the projects are going to do better than expected. Some, they're going to do worse than expected. This is not a finance idea. It's a law of large numbers and statistics. So guess what happens to risk that affects one or a few companies as you start diversifying? It gets averaged out. If you don't believe me, if any of your portfolios read the news for a couple of weeks and you go through you know, periods of acceleration as you read about a stock you own doing really good things, the next page, there'll be another stock you own doing terrible things. So you see Facebook going up and Google, Google. What if you own Microsoft and Google as I do in my portfolio? I had very mixed feelings that day. Microsoft jumped, Google dropped, but it's the nature of spreading your bets. So as you get to be diversified, it's not just that each investment becomes a smaller portion of your portfolio, but you get this averaging out play out. So diversification reduces the overall exposure to firm-specific risk. The macro risk, the inflation interest rate, is not going to go away no matter how many stocks you own. And here's where the CAPA makes its second big assumption. It assumes the marginal investor in your stock is likely to be diversified. You're saying, who the heck is the marginal investor? The marginal investor is the investor who actually affects prices by trading at the margin. I'm not going to insult you by asking you, I've never been a marginal investor in a stock. Why? I don't have enough money to move the price. So to be the marginal investor, you need to be a pretty big investor. Investor owns hundreds of millions of shares, not 1,000 or even 10,000 shares. And you need to trade those shares. So who do you think the marginal investor is in most publicly traded companies? You don't even have to think large companies, most even small companies. Who has the capacity to own a lot of shares in these companies and trade those shares? You got two monsters in the room. You can name them right now. Vanguard and BlackRock, right? Why well, they're going to show up at every list because when you have an $11 trillion fund, guess what? You're everywhere. In fact, if you have a conspiracy theory view of the world, here's what I'd suggest you do. Pick companies in 50 markets. Take the 10 largest companies. Look at the largest shareholders in each company. And it's like, where's Waldo? There's BlackRock every single list. Because you have $11 trillion. How can you not be there? So when you think about marginal investors, don't think about whether you're diversified. Think about those investors. And are those investors diversified? I would think so. You're not going to become a $5 billion, $50 billion fund putting your money in one stock. That's at the heart of the CAPM assumption that the marginal investor is diversified. So I'm going to leave you with a template. Think about whether in your company, and I hope you picked a company because that's going to be the next part of what I want you to explore, is, is this assumption okay? Because if it is okay, you can use the CAPM. If it's not, then none of the risk and return models in finance work that well. Is the marginal investor di diversified? And here are the three things I want to look at. I want to look at what percentage of shares in your company are held by insiders. And it's, it's, public, it's public information. You can pull it up, not just for the US, but around the world. So sometimes the insiders are founders. So I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing. What percentage of shares are held by institutions? Again, you can find that for almost every publicly traded company in the world. And what percentage are held by individual investors or as they're insultingly called retail investors? I've never understood why they're attached. I want to look up those statistics and I also want to look up not just how many shares are owned, but how much of the trading comes from these three groups. Because I'll wager as you start looking at these lists, you're going to very quickly see that 
even in companies in remote emerging markets, a marginal investor who drives the price is going to be some type of institutional investor, sometimes foreign, sometimes domestic, which effectively means you can also safely assume that the way they think about risk comes from risk added to a portfolio, not risk standing alone. So go back to that page you saw for answering where does the power lie? Take another look at the page because you're gonna be looking for a who's holding shares in the company. And this is my 2013 update for Disney and I'll leave you with this page. Notice that Steve Jobs passing made his Lorraine Jobs the largest single shareholder in Disney. And there's a new name on the list, George Lucas. How the heck did he get there? When Disney bought Star Wars, he became one of the largest shareholders. So take a look at this page. And the question we're asking is, are, is it in my company, is it safe to assume the margin investor is diversified? Because that becomes a critical question to answer. You can, please come on. change the cost of capital every year for time because the debt ratio will be different and you get the same answer. So change, right? Mm -hmm. Or you adjust the cash flow equity for the fact that if your debt ratio is stable, you now have to go borrow in the future. And that's not unusual. Growing firms will always have net cash flows and debt that are usually positive because if you're growing, your debt will also be brought. If it doesn't grow, your debt ratio over time will go towards zero because you get to be a really big firm and you do that. So that consistency argument is why it's part of the issue. So there's no growth. So when you can put the 70, but it's not 75, it would be 87. Because when you do just the 75 going to 3%, you're basically keeping the debt at the old level, right? Because you're not bringing in any new debt. You're going to understate the value of that debt. Okay, you're not capturing the fact that debt is growing. You have one or two choices. Either go back to your firm value approach and change your cost of capital over time with a lower debt ratio over time. And we'll talk about why the cost of capital will be different with less debt. So you can see your weight on debt will get lower, your cost of capital actually gets higher over time. And eventually, your cost of capital will approach the cost of equity. 
Why? Because it gets big enough that your debt ratio will approach zero, right? Think a hundred years from now, your debt is still stuck at what it is today. Okay. You'll end up with an all equity funded company, which is not, not good or bad, but it means you can't keep the cost of capital fixed if your debt ratio is zero. Okay. So we're assuming that the 400, uh, the value of debt is the present value. Right oh, it's, it's the existing debt, right? So it's whatever debt you've taken on, because when you do debt in a debt to capital ratio, you don't count future debt issues. You just count what debt you have today. So you don't even have to assume that. That's a given. So today you're 400 million in debt. You expect to grow 3% a year. And because you expect to grow 3% a year, think of the growth 3% you got to build new factories. You know where you're getting the money. You're getting it partially from debt. That's what the 12 million is. And that's the extra cash flow you're getting. So you don't even need to assume that this is the debt today. It's, it is always the debt today. Debt in a cost of capital calculation is debt today. Um, it's never. Given, it's not. You don't have to calculate. It's whatever. It's, not, it's what right. you owe, right? So if you it's liquidate the firm today, you're not going to be paying off future debt holders. You're going to be paying off who you pay today. So debt is very tangible. It's what you owe today. Okay. So this, the problem in this example will be that you basically are not counting in the extra cash flow. So this is not a cash flow from operations. This is cash flow from financing that you're getting as an equity investor. It won't show up in your income statement, right? Mm -hmm. The 12 million is coming from the fact that you're borrowing money. So it's a cash flow stream. That's why it's, don't think of these as earnings numbers. These are cash flow numbers. And because they're cash flow numbers, your cash flows as an equity investor can either come from your business, which is the 75 million, or it can come from borrowing more money. It's a very messy concept. Most people who do valuation don't even think through it because, they, because you see people value companies with a constant with a constant cost of capital. The minute you do that and you have a growing company, whether you like it or not, you've implicitly assumed. So if I take Tesla and I let it grow 40% here and I keep the debt ratio at 5%, the dollar debt every year is going to grow at 30% a year. There's a substance. The reason you don't see it in a traditional valuation is because we do free cash flow to the firm. And the free cash flow to the firm, debt in and out doesn't show up any cash flows. But the minute you go to free cash flow equity, it gets really messy because you've got to factor that in. Okay. Good luck. No. Sure, yeah. Take.